to say something? Oh, sorry. Good morning. Uh, it's Hillary, and this is Sunday Morning Live with John M. And here is our host, John M. Good morning. You see, life is like an obstacle course. Some ride in limousines, some ride a horse. Some raise children, some get divorced. We all have our crosses to bear. We all have our burdens to share. And life is not always fair. Along the way, we are tested and blessed. What we do with our blessings is one of our tests. Blessed are the ones with the fewest regrets when we get to the finishing line. If you're weary and worn at the time, our life is not always kind. So much has been written about evil and good We all have our demons, that's understood It's not who did the best, but the best that they could Who will be rewarded in time When we get to the finishing line The rest will go around one more time But you ask, why do innocent children die young While wicked ones prosper and thrive But the wealth of the wicked is here and it's gone And we all know that everyone dies It all is the same in God's eyes Now I've probably left out a detail or two Just try to treat others As you'd have them treat you If we all help each other Then we all will get through And the questions that weigh on our minds Will all be answered in time When we get to the finishing line That was finishing line from my current CD, M6, and sitting with me, accompanying me on that really nice sparkling guitar behind me, is the one and only Paul Zolo. Hey, John. Uh, author of... Hi, John uh, fans. ...of Songwriters on Songwriting 1 and 2, and um, uh, along with many other things, and a great songwriter in his own right, and singer and performer, and uh, usually... Uh, when, I, when we do these things, I, I sit here and I interview whoever is with me for a little bit, and I've done that with Paul a couple of times now. But today we're going to kind of turn things around, and Paul is going to grill me. <laughs> so uh, and I'm I am going to grill. That's I'm, exactly what I'm, I'm well. Do. I'm looking forward to it because I, in my humble opinion, you are as good as any interviewer in the business. So uh, thank I'm, you very much. I, uh, I admire your work, and I, I look forward to being interrogated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's usually pretty gentle what I do. Yeah. I have true no reverence. <laughs> yeah. I love songwriters and songwriting more than anything. So I love to talk to great songwriters. Now, my research... And me. <laughs> and, and, please. As we were saying earlier, almost all great songwriters are humble, too. You know, they don't want to put a lot of, you know, light on themselves because we know the stuff comes from beyond us often. Don't you feel that? I do. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's... Um, I don't think we're completely. I think we we make a contribution. Mm. You know, I, I don't. I don't think it, it's something that just happens to us. But um, uh, I do think it's it, there's something there's like an I don't know an external consciousness or something 
you know, Keith Richards once described it as, they say, well, it's all just out there in the ether, you know, and we're mm. like antennae. Right. If you tap into the right frequency, you pick it up, you know. And of course, I think he's, he's kind of onto something there. He's got <laughs> so, Mick to finish the lyrics well, yes, for him. You know, Mick true. does a lot of the hard work for him. Yeah, right? yeah. But it's good that you say that because some songwriters, they want it to be one or the other. You know, yeah. either songs come in a spiritual way or I they, the they don't at all. <laughs> yeah. And some, you know, even great songwriters feel like funny for even taking credit for it. But you're right, it's a combination of both. You have to be a songwriter for those songs to come to you. It doesn't, it doesn't just mm -hmm. come to civilians, right? And there is, I think there is, too, uh, a, a craft to it. that one, Even if one is born with some innate talent for, you know, for creating... Um, just as we have to learn, you know, when we're very little, you know, we have to learn how to speak English and proper grammar and so forth. And I think there's a learning process. Um, you know, you, you, we might have an innate ability to, to capture something um, that later becomes a song, but I think there is a craft to actually finishing it off and making it, you know, palatable for, for the general public. Uh, but I think the trap that some people fall into is they get too um, obsessed with the craft, <laughs> you know, and they bury themselves in, you know, what rhymes with what and what meter is this and, and uh, you know, what, have, what should I or shouldn't I switch keys and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think all those things are important and they're all important tools, but I don't think they all have to be used on every song. And uh, I think if you, you know, that... I realized a long time ago that the for me the challenge is is the balance of you know using all those tools when I need them but keep it from the heart always stay focused on whenever I find that I'm I'm having a hard time coming up with the next line or the next verse or I'm not sure where to go in a song I just try to take myself back to what is the core emotion mm -hmm. what am I feeling you know even if I can't put words to it is it just in general terms is it anger is it is it uh, longing is it frustration? Whatever it is, come back to that, and that'll that'll lead me to wherever I need to go lyrically. I think. Yeah, I think that was such a beautiful way of describing what our job is as songwriters. That it is a craft, and it's a beautiful craft. And in some ways, it's an ancient and old-fashioned craft. And a lot of those craft elements don't mean as much to a lot of modern songwriters as they used to, like perfect rhymes. Mm -hmm. Yet all those things, as you know well, they add a lot of richness and you know to songs. Those craft elements are there for a reason. But at the same time, we don't want anything contrived. So it's such a funny job to try to contrive something to where it doesn't sound contrived. So you, exactly. It's kind of, you know, you mentioned my books. This is the sequel, which John had on his shelf, so I didn't have to bring it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I've talked to songwriters about that very thing. Uh, and people say, you know, you can't teach songwriting. And that's true, but you can learn a lot about the craft and about, and about that dynamic of how you combine the art and the craft. You know, the, the, the best compliment I ever got on a song was, uh, I was playing in a bookstore in Nashville one time, and I was playing the song, you know, Could Have Had You. And, uh, and there's a line in that song, I could have had my, uh, my own personal beautiful queen. Hey, it's not as far-fetched as it seems. I could have had you. And, and the rhymes kind of make that line work. And, and I saw a guy react to it in the audience when I, when I sang it. So afterwards, I went and, and sat down with him for a second, and I thanked him. You know, I said, I could tell you were really listening, and, and I, I said, I saw you react to that one line. I said, that's my favorite line in the song, too, so, you know, thank you. And he said to me, he said, you know, when I, when I first heard that line, when, it, when the, the words first came out, they surprised me. And he said, a fraction of a second later, I realized there was there was no other place you could have gone with it. It had to be that line. Mm. I, I thought, man, I, I must have done something right yeah. on that one. <laughs> and that's the goal, not you know? to write a song that people go, wow, that was clever and unexpected, exactly. but to yeah. write one that they go, wow, that's perfect, you know? Yeah. And to create something in the world that's perfect, it's unusual. You don't get to do that in most no, no. You know, earthly endeavors. I'm not sure I've ever done it, but, but we close. try to come close. Yeah, you know? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So you were born in 54, so... Uh, what, what what music were you hearing when you were growing up? Did you have special uh, heroes or, or music that was really inspiring you well, when you were a the kid? Kind of, kind of the beginning of my conscious musical life was probably seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan because that was just this whole... 64. So wow, you, know, you, were you know, what's what's I was 10, yeah. But before that, um, I you know my parents used to... They listened to a, a moderate amount of classical music, but they also listened to... 
a lot of, I used to hear the Kingston Trio all the time. They used to play those records. One, two, and three, Jolly Coach, man. Mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, yeah. And, um, and Tom Dooley, you know, I used to hear that all the time and sing along with it and stuff. And um, Sammy on camera. There was uh, Oscar Brand, the, the Oscar comedic Brand. songwriter. They, they used to listen, play him a lot. And my father used to be really into the old, uh, and this is, was true even as I was growing up, but he was into the, the, the country royalty, you know, Johnny Cash and George mm -hmm. Jones and all those guys. Um, so I got, and of course my father was also an artist, um, a painter, uh -huh. you know. He played a little bit of guitar too, but he never did it publicly. He oh. just did it for his own amusement and banjo. But uh, and then, not that long after the Beatles, when I was in my early teens, or mid early to mid teens, the I won't tell you the first one, but the second concert I ever saw, the second real professional public concert, was at the Fillmore East. It was a school trip. They put us all on a school bus. And took us from Connecticut into uh, New York City. And we saw Triple Bill, Albert King, Chuck Berry, and The Who. Whoa. <laughs> and, and, and The Who were previewing Tommy. They had finished it, but they hadn't released it yet. Wow. And so, so they were previewing it. And, I mean, I, you know, I've been a concert holic ever since. So... Uh, that's yeah. really interesting. You had the Kingston Trio, and then you had Chuck Berry and the Who. Yeah. That comes across even when you play acoustic. But you, you always rock out, even when you're solo. You have a lot mm -hmm. of rock, even when you're doing a folky kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that blend makes sense. So uh, when did you start playing? How old were you? When I first picked up a guitar, I was probably 13, uh, around there, 12, 13. And uh, my, uh, some people know this, but, but I'll, I'll go over it real quick. But I, I thought I wanted to play drums. And my parents didn't want me to play drums. They were too noisy, mm -hmm. you know, banging around like the basement. Most parents, and, you know, right? Like maybe not. And, <laughs> and my, my my parents said you should play a guitar. You know, it's a pretty instrument. You can serenade a girl with it. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's easier to carry around than drums are. And I no, I want drums. So my father said, he said, I'll make you this deal. He said, take enough guitar lessons at our expense to just learn how to play one song and play it for us. And once you've done that, if you still want drums, he said, I'll take you to any music store you want. You pick out any drum kit you want, and I'll buy it for you. And I thought, piece of cake! <laughs> you know, this is, thank you. And I went, and of course, he must have spoken to the guitar teacher beforehand, but on my first lesson, I sat down with this guy. I just want to learn how to play one song. <laughs> you know, that's all, I don't care what it is, I, I just got to play a song for my dad. And the guitar teacher, he said, well, that's fine. We can do that. But I said, you know, before you can play a song, you have to learn how to play chords. And before you can learn chords, you have to learn the notes. So there's kind of a step-by-step -step process here. But we can get you playing the song pretty quick. And I said, well, how long is all this going to take? And he said, oh, maybe, you know, half a dozen lessons. Okay, good. Let's get started. Mm. <laughs> and, and thus, that was a smart teacher. Yes. Know, I could do that right away. Yeah. Half a dozen lessons. Right. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... So thus began my love affair with the guitar. So what was the first song that you did learn that you could that you played? Do you remember? I, I don't remember the the first the first thing he taught me to play in single notes was Jingle Bells. All right, but that wasn't what I played for my parents. I, I knew I couldn't get away with that. Ding ding ding, <laughs> you know. So was, but so but I don't already... remember what the first song was, but I I, I might have already by the time I could started being able to play songs, I might have already forgotten about that. So were, you, so. were you already singing? Were you? Could you? Sing? Oh yeah, I sang before I played the guitar. Okay, so I, I sang before my voice changed. Yeah. And, you know, oh baby. <laughs> yeah, me you too. Know. And then there was that fun period when it just would crack between oh, yes, the two. Yes, yes. That's a good sound, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> great. So, how old were you when you wrote your first song? Well, here again, I mean, I, I wrote before I could play the guitar. I used to make up songs. But they, oh yeah, but they were they were really stupid little songs because I was Gotta a start kid, you know, right? and, sure. and I yes. I wrote songs. I didn't know anything, you know. They say write what you know. I didn't know anything, so I just made stuff up from, you know, I'd I'd watch car races on TV and I'd write a song about somebody wrecking a car in a car race, and you know, so you were they were songs, horrible songs, but, songs to sing even before you were playing yes. singing songs. That's cool. Yeah, that's like kind of unusual too. The, the first the first real song I wrote was probably in my. Probably in my late teens. Do you remember the name of it? I don't. Sorry. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll find that out. <laughs> yeah. Your fans want to know. This. <laughs> but, so when you started writing songs with guitar and you started doing it seriously, was that something you enjoyed? And did you just keep doing it, or was it sporadic? Oh yeah, no, song? I loved it, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and I started playing with other people. I played my first my first trio was uh, this guy that all he had was a little plastic snare drum and a cymbal. And then a little while later, he got, mm -hmm. a, he got a second plastic snare drum. They turned the snares off so he could use that as a tom-tom, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, no kick drum. And then, I, and then I, I got to, he and I got together with another friend who had a little, uh, like a Lafayette electric guitar and a, and a little amp. And we just, we jammed and played and, and we played songs like... Uh, Come on down to my boat, baby, and stuff like that. And I do remember my my very first real performance where I played guitar. I, I had one performance before this where I sang, but but my first performance playing guitar with these other two guys was at a private party, and we only knew seven songs, <laughs> and and it was all grown ups at this party, and and they were all oh, aren't they cute? And they made us play all seven songs three times. Ah. so. <laughs> You know, Tom so, Petty, same thing. His first gig, all instrumentals. They had like four songs that they got. Mm -hmm. And it was so good, they asked him, can you just do it again? Because yeah. they didn't have anything else. And that, yeah. that's a good way to start. Yeah. Like, you got to learn more songs. Yeah. So, so you were doing several, a lot of covers. Then. Oh, yeah. Mostly covers when I started. And when, and when that changed was when I, I was, you know, I was doing a lot of club dates and restaurants and coffee houses and stuff like that in Connecticut. Uh, and now I'm into my, you know, my, my 20s, uh, late 20s even. And, um, um, the, you know, back then they all wanted mostly covers. And, and it, you can throw in a few originals, but make sure you do a lot of stuff people know. So I did. And I, and I, I started getting compliments on some of my originals where, you know, at the end of a night, people would say, I really like that song you did about Jesus or whatever, you know. And, and I, oh, really? And. You know, so I started getting more compliments on original songs than on covers. So I took that as a kind of a sign that I could keep pushing the envelope. And I got to the part point where I was doing about 50-50 uh, covers and originals, sometimes a little bit more original. And then I moved to Nashville. And when I first got to Nashville, I started kind of doing the same thing. And, you know, Nashville's a songwriting town. And people said, why are you playing all these covers, man? Do more originals. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long for me to get to the point where I was doing strictly originals and just not doing any covers at all, or very, very rarely. But when you were doing um, covers at first, what, what kind of covers were you doing? Whose songs? Well, it depend I had this kind of identity crisis for a while, where with electric or acoustic. You yeah. know? So I, I, for a long time, I felt like it had to be one or the other. You know? So I had, a, I, had a, I had a rock trio where it was, it was me and a bass player and a drummer. And he had the big double bass drum kit and the Marshall stacks and all that stuff. And we did a lot of stuff like Mississippi Queen by Mountain and a and, uh, uh, couple of Who songs and uh, one or two Hendrix songs. And, uh, you know, uh, some pretty hardcore stuff for the time yeah. like that. And, uh, and that's where, and I, I, a lot of big Pete Townsend influence on me back then. I did a lot of jumping around. Yeah. And, and, you still uh, do. I can see you that. Know, you knocking microphones over and all that kind <laughs> of thing. Funny. And um, and but or if I wasn't doing that, I was doing the acoustic gigs. So I'd do Needle in the Damage Done and and uh, Neil Young. you know Wild World and and uh, Cat Stevens. Uh, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Stephen Stills. You know. That's interesting because I've only seen you play acoustic for years, but I can always sense there's a rocker in you because yeah, everybody always, like, says that. Yeah. So I was wondering if you were playing with rock, but. So back then you would seg segregate the two. There'd be your rock self and then your folk yeah, self. Yeah, and I eventually did get to the point where I realized that the, the two can kind of blend. And, and I've had a couple of bands between then and now where I've, I've done some acoustic stuff and some rock stuff. My dream band, that I've, I've come close to having it a couple of times, but we weren't really able to sustain it. Um, we came pretty close when I, when I did the CD release show with a band for my, my album M6. But <clears throat> I, would, I would love to have a band where we could do some just balls to the walls rockers um and uh and and maybe a couple of solo acoustic songs with everything else falling kind of in between somewhere yeah you know i think that'd be fun yeah it'd be great you know? 
we, we grew up with show. we grew up with bands like that all the time. The Beatles would do very simple oh, yeah. Mother Nature yeah. Son to Helter Skelter. Bob Seger yeah. used to do a lot of you know. Or Crosby Stills Nash Young come out and open with Feel Like a Number, and then he'd go into uh, you know Blame It on the Moon. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. Nowadays they want you to stay in one bin more right. more carefully. I got a lot of that in Nashville too. Well, well you know. What do you want to be? You want to be a rock guy? Or you want to be a country guy? Can't be both. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Yes, I can. <laughs> musicians are really encouraged. To pick your bin and stay there. <laughs> yeah. And don't get too diverse, you know? Yeah. But musicians know. I mean, we like all kinds of music and uh Yeah. It's it's so sometimes this this business can be kind of tough. Do you find that that sometimes the business encourages you to do stuff that isn't really helpful for your art? Oh, no, I find the music business to be very easy. <laughs> you can explain that to me how that works. <laughs> no, I think, it's, uh, I think it's harder now than it's ever been. Um, I, I, certainly as a business, uh, you know, making a living, making money, playing music and writing it, I think is harder now than it's ever been. Um, I, uh, and it's, I mean, nobody wants to pay anymore for live music, especially, unless you can guarantee you know, uh, to pack the place and then you get from the door, but, but, um, not, you know, not a lot of people can do that consistently. And, um, it, it's more everything, everything we do with the possible exception of recording is more expensive. Now traveling with a band and, and all of that is more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the equipment, the PA equipment, a lot of that stuff is, is more expensive. It's better, but it, it costs more. And it just, you know, there's just so many considerations now. Just just general expenses. Just living is is more expensive. Uh, recording <clears throat> has has become easier in that you don't you don't any longer have to go to a a major um, you know million dollar multi million dollar studio uh, with a crew and producers and all that in order to make a decent recording. Now you can you know for 500 or 1000 dollars you can get a little pro pro tools rig and mm -hmm. and a couple microphones and set them up and and do some recording which is nice in a way and that it brings recording kind of into the reach of a lot more people but it also floods the market with a lot more substandard recordings right so now we have to you know as James Lee Stanley when he was here last week he said well you know he said, as much as we all like to malign the record labels, he said that the good thing about the day when, when the record labels were king was that they were our filters. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they, we, we got, we didn't have to weed through everything that was out there because they did that. And, and for a while they were good at it. Um, but then things changed and, and now there almost are no record labels. So now we, we have to do all that filtering ourselves and it's a daunting task. Yeah, so. I, mean, I know that well in my, in my day job. I work for this magazine, which... It's this guy, Robert Plant. He was in a band called Led Zeppelin. I I've heard of it. Yes. But I get, you know, a million CDs to review because I review CDs. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it used to be if someone put out an album, there was probably a really good reason why they got signed. And yeah. nowadays, that's often true with CDs, but often not true that anyone can make a CD, even people that really don't know what they're doing in terms of and singing people who or songwriting. Signed. You don't have to be signed anymore. You right, just, exactly. So the, Yeah, so there's a glut. Yeah. It used to be that every album meant more, didn't it? Yeah, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and, and as you know, a lot of people don't listen to albums anymore. They're just listening to songs and on their phone. But like me, I know you grew up with albums. So do albums still matter to you? And will you always make albums for your for your own music? Do you think? You know, I, it's funny you ask me that because I I've, I've just been I've been pondering that a lot lately. I I, I probably will still put albums uh, together in one form or another. Um, but just because I think it's good to have collections of songs, but I, I am aware that nobody, I miss the days when we used to, and it continued for a little while, even into CDs, but, but, uh, I miss the days when we used to run out to the record store and buy a record, an album, take it home, sit down maybe with a couple of friends and play side one all the way through. Nobody talked, you know, maybe you'd drink, you know, Coke or something. You listen to it all the way through, Maybe turn it over, it. yeah, all of that, <laughs> and turn it over and play side two all the way through, and then talk about which songs you like better than, you know, that's all gone now, yeah. and, and now it's all the single and one song at a time, and half the time people don't even, it, it kills me that, that, you know, I'll be driving around uh, with, with people in my car sometimes, and 
so, you know, somebody will put something on on their on their phone or whatever, you know, and or they'll be scanning around the dial on the radio, or whatever, and some song will come on, and so they go, "Oh, I love this song," and they'll be like singing along with it and stuff, and halfway through the song, they switch to something else. <laughs> right, right. I'm like, I right. thought you loved this song. Yeah. It's like, that's enough of it. <laughs> yeah. We had a minute and a half. That's yeah, enough. yeah, that's right. right. That's not overdo it. So yeah, and, and so um, I don't know. You know, people just aren't buying albums anymore for whatever reason. And uh, I think it's a, a sad thing. I miss those days. I also, you mentioned, you know, people listening now on iPhones. I miss the days of the big home component stereo system where yeah. the, with the big speakers and the tuner and the graphic EQ and mm -hmm. all that, you know, right. that's all going. We mentioned too. you went to school in Boston, you went to Berkeley and I, I went to Boston university and we go to Nuggets, you know, the record store, there where you could get an album for a dollar oh, and take it home and live in that album. There was no TV, there was no phones. We were just in the album. Yeah. And like you said, we would just absorb it. And and we and as a kid too, I would read every lyric. I mean, that's the world I, I grew up in. That's all I ever wanted to do was make those. So it's By funny to come up in a, in a business when the thing we 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 were inspired by has shifted so radically. Right. By the way, you mentioned getting it for a dollar. Mm -hmm. that, that that concert I went to when I was young with uh, Albert King, Chuck Berry, The Who, I think we paid $18 for, to see all three of them. Not you know, cheap you back can't, then. You, no, but, but, but affordable. Right. And, you know, when I was in Boston, we you, can't, to, you can't park at a concert now for $18. Yeah. Bucks, you know. In Boston, we so. go to concerts for 5 bucks, And I remember Elton John came out and was charging $15 a ticket. Yeah. We were shocked. <laughs> $15 for a concert? It was, it's a different world. And in Boston, yeah. you didn't have to park. You could just take the T. Yeah, what did, what did we pay, baby, for, for uh, Billy Joel? 200 250 something like that? 350 Three for Per ticket? 350 per ticket for to Billy see Joel, Joel uh, at Dodger Stadium. And we were in the nosebleed seats. Was it worth that? it? Well, it was a great concert. Um, yeah. it, it was... Uh, it seemed like an awful lot of money for the seats we had. We, we watched most of it on the Jumbotron. Isn't and they were doing a lot of artsy fartsy effects on the jumbotron, so we only really got a good look at him a, a part of the time, you know. Um, it's not quite the same when it's costing hundreds yes. of dollars and yes, it's, it's, it's glorified it's, watching TV, yeah. you know, for several hundred dollars. But as we know in the music business, that's where those guys are making the money. They have to tour because they're not making it off of record right. sales or song royalties like they right. used to. At the same time, I, see if you find this heartening that even with the change in technology and how things have changed. Songs still matter as much, it seems. They haven't replaced the song itself. I mean, do you find that the songs are still as important as ever? I, I, I do. I, maybe, maybe to a slightly diminished degree, but I, I certainly think that... I think it's... On the one hand, I think most people who are not musicians or songwriters don't listen as much to lyrics anymore as they used mm -hmm. to. And I think part of that may be that, with some exceptions, as we've discussed, that, uh, you know... The general quality of lyric writing it seems to be kind of going down from what I hear, but but there are still some good ones, and and um, you know so I, I don't think people focus on lyrics as much as they used to, except for people who are into writing. But I do still think the other side of that coin is I think that almost everybody can tell you that there's a particular song or a particular couple of songs that they really love. Oh, this this or that song really speaks to me. You know, yeah. by whatever artist, and it's not just famous artists. But, yeah. You know, there are people who say that about my songs. Absolutely. You know, so, sometimes those. Um, if we saw Jules Shear together, sometimes those secret heroes, their songs are even more important to us. Yeah. Everyone yeah. doesn't know them. One of the, you know, as you know, the magic of songs is that combination of language with with music and melody. And to this day, you know, what what makes a melody compelling is it's a mysterious thing. You can't really explain it. Do you find that the melodies still matter? And what, what do you think makes a melody good? What draws you in with a melody? In one sense, I think it kind of works the same way a rhyme does in a song. You, you hear a particular melodic line, a melodic passage, and you expect the note to go this place and it goes that place. And you go, oh, that's kind of cool. Mm. And, and I think rhymes and lyrics work the same way. It, you, you, you know... The second line ends up saying exactly what you wanted to say, and it rhymes. It's like a double whammy. And and could you have said it some other way that didn't rhyme, and might it still have had an impact? Sure, but it's just a little added something special when it does rhyme. And and I think melody works that way too. I think it 
it is hard to describe. You're right. I, I think there are just some some melodies that I just feel more emotion from. It again, it comes back to staying close to the heart and uh, for me and coming close to the emotion. If I'm if I'm playing a song or uh, trying to write a song, and sometimes I know the I know the words are right, and but I, I get to a certain line in the song and it's just it's not quite hitting me the way I want it to emotionally. It's not stirring me the way I thought it would. Mm -hmm. That's when I say, well, you know, maybe if I went up here instead of down, you know, mm -hmm. and and then it, and and it happens to me sometimes when I'm when I'm performing or practicing, where I'll just I'll do the, just very slight changes that are. It's not really rewriting the melody, but you you maybe sing a harmony note or something. Yeah, and, a slight and, variation, and like, just a yeah. very slight difference in delivery, and um, um, and and it, and it. It kind of rings a bell, you know. Oh, that that kind of worked better. I'll I'll do it that way from now on. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. So it's, it's a feel thing. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's I like that you mentioned rhymes, because rhyming, like melody, is a very very ancient thing for men to rhyme mm -hmm. and a very contrived thing to do. But when you do it in a way that it doesn't seem phony, that it just works, that's such a pleasing effect that you don't you don't really get in life in other ways. But in the song, it it just completes things in a beautiful way. You, don't you think? Yeah, I do. And and. I'll tell you, this thought just occurred to me. They, they, I've, I've realized recently that one thing I've, I've come to be able to recognize in songs is when, in songwriting, is when somebody's written a song and they have a lot to say and they didn't really put a lot of thought into the melody and the meal, melody just seems to kind of meander. And I can, I can kind of tell that the person was was like, well, I got to put some kind of melody to this, and I can't just all be the same note. It's got to go somewhere, but I have these words I have to get through. So they just kind of meander it, and, you know, mm -hmm. I saw you yesterday, and I thought something might be wrong, but I didn't know. And, <laughs> you know, and it, it's like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> yeah, craft. <laughs> right, it, it comes down to craft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Melodies too. You you don't want them to be too complex that you know someone can't sing along, and you know you, yeah you don't want it to be no, too you, simplistic too. Don't, don't you it's hate it when, when somebody tries to get you to sing along to some really complicated? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I see that all the time. Come on, everybody sing along. It was this way, that way. <laughs> you know they go. They, <laughs> you know if you want somebody to sing along, give me something like uh, you know. Memory Lane is a good one. You know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's one of John's songs. <laughs> that's very funny. That is not a sing-along song, but I take but a, your hint. But a great and, melody, I got it. Oh, thank you. This is a. I will, I will play this if you will promise to play something of yours afterwards. It's and, a, and we it's can a good deal. we can maybe still squeeze in another question or two, but but we should get to some more music. So it's for you guitar nerds, he's playing an E, but it's D drop. Detuning with the capo on the second show fret. Capo. Only a guitar nerd would appreciate that. Like yes. Yeah. Oh, I almost, I almost started playing the other song. Uh, I almost started playing. Uh, that was an easy finishing well. line. No, wait a minute. Shoot. Give me a second. Take your time. Hey, wait, we're on live. Right? Yeah, we are live. I got it now. Okay. Come along with me, she said. A little walk down memory lane. I said. What's there to remember? I mean, what besides the pain? She said, if that's all you remember, oh, that really is a shame. I remember what I need to, I said. I remember it was good and now it's dead. Choose not to resurrect it in my head Cause it would only die again
Oh, is that how you see life? She said, what a pessimistic view. I said, it's not how I see life. It's just how I see you. Oh, your words, they sting, she said. I said, they sting because they're true. And the truth is all you left me when you left me. And it was painful, yes, but nonetheless a gift. A compass when I was abandoned and adrift. And it led me home again. Now memory lane is a long and scenic highway. There are mountains and valleys and plains And you are just one mile Where I was detoured for a while Where my greatest love became my greatest pain Memory lane Come along with me, she said, a little walk down memory lane. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. When did you write that one? When did I write that one? Um, it wasn't that, even though it's on my current CD, it's not that recent. I, th I think I wrote it when I was living in Nashville which would have been pre-2000. Um, so you had it for a while before you recorded yeah, that one, huh? Yeah, So do you write all the time, or do you write just for a special? Oh, I wish. I, I, I wish I was one of those writers that just had the self-discipline self to, to just get up every day and write. Um, I'm trying to work toward that. I, I am, I'm trying to make myself right now or work on writing things in, in other in other ways, I'm, you know, I'm, I've, I've, go, I've resumed keeping a journal now, oh, yeah. so that's because that's writing in, in one sense, and uh, and I do try to play a little guitar every day. Uh, and just, just uh, a little, you just play a little guitar every day? Uh, not as much as I would like. Um, I, I I get living in L.A. I get busy with other things, you know, but. Uh, uh, I, I try to play for close to an hour a day, sometimes a little less, sometimes more. But. And when you when you start a song, do you generally try to finish it then, or do you work on songs for a while when you got one going? Oh, I have, I have some songs that have come out. It, it's really more up to the song than it is to me, I find. Uh, I, I have some songs that have just come out of me in the time it takes to play them, from beginning to end, finished. And I have songs that have taken close to a year to finish that, that um, I have one song uh, you know I, I won't I won't play it for you now but I'll just give you a little a little bit of the progression that I have uh, it's an older song of mine one of those angry rockers okay, yeah, not like my this. way and it's, it's, I usually play it on six strings Sorry, for two new life yeah I you know and it goes on from there I got that progression and uh, six months, I hadn't been able to put any words to it. And I tried a, a number of times, and, and I just kept coming up with crap. And going on, taking the lead from something that, that um, David Wilcox said in a, in a seminar I went to with him, he, uh, he told people, he said, writer's block is the muse's way of telling you that you're trying to write the wrong song. Mm. And uh, so I thought about that, and I, and I thought... It's, this this ties right in with what I was saying before about staying close to your heart and your emotion. I thought, well, what is what is that progression? Say, what's the emotion behind that progression? What does that feel like? You know, not, not thinking about any words or anything, but just what does that make it's me feel like? Out here. I love that. Yeah. And and uh, and I thought, well, it's angry. 
it's an angry progression. So what am I angry about? And then it, that led me into the song. That's all, a good way. You know, what are you angry about right now? That's that's a good one. Yeah. But that says so, so much that uh, people who don't write songs maybe don't understand that because they're short. How long yeah. could it take you to write something that's three minutes long? But sometimes it could take a year. But yeah. other times they can come through. And I think every serious songwriter has had that feeling where they just come through like a gift. Yeah. But when and you, when and that's... that's I'm sorry. And, well, I just I think the challenge and one, the, one of the bigger challenges in songwriting is to keep it short and concise. There, mm -hmm. there are very few, very, very few songwriters like Dylan who can get away with writing a, a you know a fifteen or twenty minute song. Yeah, uh, yeah. Most people can't. I mean, anybody could do it, but but not many people could do it and have people listen to it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. And that's where uh, I come from. So, so for, for some. For many songs, it's easier for me to write eight verses than to write three that say everything, like Randy Newman can. But even Dylan about some of those songs, like he said to me, he goes, some of those are just too much and not enough. You know, you have ten verses and it's still not there, you know? Well, and I've had a, no, a lot of songs where I'll write five, six, eight verses and then I'll trim it down. I'll yeah, take yeah. the three that work So best. you do that. I do that as well. Yeah. I used to call it cutting it out. Now I call it culling. You know, yeah. I said it as yeah. like destroying stuff. You got a song for us, Paul? I do. Speaking of simple ones, this was this is a simple one. This is called Clock in the Sky. I was tuning while you were talking. That's so rude, isn't it? No. No, that's not. It's necessary. The you guitarists know you have to tune each string. It's really important. Every one. You do? Did you know that? <laughs> that's why I don't play a 12 string. That's too much work. I used to. I remember when I started doing open mics in Chicago before the age of the, the tuner. And so I wasn't very good by tuning by ear on stage. And uh, the, the guy who was running it, Jim Hirsch, kind of a Chicago big shot, said, you know, your songs are pretty good, Paul, but you gotta learn to tune your guitar. It's like kind of with disgust, you gotta do that. So uh, these tuners for me have been just the greatest thing. Because <laughs> being in tune really is much better. So this is called Clock in the Sky. Go by and 
bad There is a cloud in the sky There is a cloud There is a cloud in the sky There is a cloud That's gorgeous. That might be my new favorite song of yours. Oh, there's nothing you want to hear better than that when someone says that. Baby, do you have time for me to do one more? Yeah. Say yes, okay. Hillary. Yeah. Yes. Baby, by the way, is Hillary. Yeah. He does all the hard work. She's holding gonna, the camera this whole time. You do a great job. I'm gonna, we're, we're, we're running a little bit long, but, but Paul and I talked about this one um, before we started this morning. And we've, we've done uh, several really mellow songs this morning, so I want to close this out with a little bit of a rocker, and it is a song about the music industry. All right. So, um, this, is, this is called. This is called Music Robots. I wrote it when I was in Nashville. R O W. And yes. And uh, I want to thank you for 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 taking this time and, and doing this interview. It's been a blast for me. Well, thanks, thanks for asking. Everything us. Everything I hoped it would. A be. lot of fun. Thank you. So, uh, Paul Zolo. And I will finish things off with this, and then we'll sign off after this. and a hundred clones and you gotta have the look and you gotta have the foot and you can get arrested but you can't get booked and they say that the streets are paved in gold if you're young and pretty and you sell your soul and in the middle of it all there's a street called Music Row where the music robots go And they come on planes Sell their houses And they change their names And they all pay dues And they all get screwed If they do what the robots tell them to And they wait on tables And they sell guitars And they drive limousines For the country stars Yeah, they drive limousines Up and down that where the music robots go Music robots, I don't think they're so hot There might be a lot that the music robots know They don't know music though From a mile away His hair is perfect With a touch of gray Snakeskin boots And a bolo tie And a Rolex watch That he did not buy And a gorgeous woman Adorns his arm Half his age Twice his charm And you wouldn't think A woman like that so, oh, he's a music robot, though. Oh, I get it. Yeah, he's a music robot, though.
There you go. I am rocking out. <laughs> Music great, Robots. Great song. Which I dedicate with love to Nashville. Beautiful. Uh, thank you again, Paul. We have run a bit long, um, so I'm, I'm, we're going to go ahead and close this out. Paul Zolo, amazing author, journalist, singer, songwriter, interviewer. Uh, this is this has really been a blast for me. Thanks for coming and doing it. Thanks for asking. Um, are you me. playing? On this are show. you playing anywhere anytime soon? Um, yeah, we're doing a coffee gallery thing. I think it's Thursday night. A tribute to the Brill Building writers. Oh, cool! Which is in beautiful Altadena, California. Yes. Yeah, that's really maybe nice you put thing. a link up there. Of course. Okay. And, and just and look me up at Facebook. You can't miss it because I shamelessly <laughs> promote myself constantly. And and when is this? I believe it's Thursday night coming up. It's coming Thursday? Yeah, it's one of the, it's the Roadhouse cool. series. Well, I am playing, uh, viewers know this, I'm, I'm playing tomorrow um, at a special benefit at the Angeles uh, National Forest Golf Course, uh, a benefit for the Foundation of Living Beauty. We've talked about that before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. It's a fundraiser for the Foundation of Living Beauty. You can go to, um, is it livingbeauty.org? Uh, yes. Uh, livingbeauty.org, all the information is there. And then um, Tuesday night, I'm going to be at uh, Matt Denny's Ale House for J.C. Hike's uh, Songwriter Serenade Show. I'm going to be doing a set there with cool. a bunch of other people. You put, a, you put a link for that, too, right? Yes, well, all this stuff will be posted. So I, I know there are a lot of people here that I, I probably so should have many. said hi to. I so know Gary many. Glasser was here. Are people yeah. watching? Are oh, like, yeah. oh, yeah. Tons hi, of people. Everyone. So my apologies for not acknowledging you more, as I usually do. We have run long as it is, and we got deep into this conversation, and I, I wanted to stay focused on that. Thank you all for joining us and for being with us this Sunday. Next Sunday, Joseph Ide will be my guest here, and a um, uh, new singer-songwriter I've just recently become familiar with, and he's very good. So we're looking forward to that. we got to run. We're running way long. Thank you again. We'll see you next time. Happy Sunday. Have a great week. Thanks for having me.